Joining me in Bristol, Peter Christofferson. Hi, Peter. Hey, hi. Thanks for inviting me to come. Thank you for coming. Now, uh, where's John right now? He's on his way to a little town called Cockermouth, which is in the, the north of England. It's in Cumbria, uh, which doesn't have anything very exciting about it at all, except a kind of rather ragged beach where you can harvest seaweed and pull razor clams out of the, the sand and fry them with garlic. And he plans to spend some time growing organic vegetables. Uh, which, as long as the salt in the air doesn't kill them first, I, I think it's a good plan. Oh. <laughs> John, John's basically spent the last uh, two and a half, three years um, experiencing an intense sort of psychoanalysis uh, at the hands of his audience, uh, you know, f very frequently, and you know, sometimes from one one show to the next. Uh, because the the kind of shows that we were doing at that time were and well I mean we continue to do uh, music that is spontaneous in the sense that uh, although the structure of a show is is the same from from one show to the next the actual content is often very different and it's a function of how we're feeling and how you know how things are with the venue and the crowd and the world events and all those things and John found uh, after two years that basically he couldn't really cope with um, that amount of intensity of experience mm. and so uh, he's he's taking a rest okay. but uh, Kyle will continue fear not we um, well, qu quite often what we the, the kind of shows that we've been doing are entirely instrumental which is not to say that they're entirely soft. Uh, they can be quite intense at places, but but uh, we will be the set that we're bringing to to, to Mutec is I'm very excited about. In it's uh, a kind of a um, an indication, if you like, of of the direction that we'll be taking over the next few years. So it's kind of you know a, a, a debut, if you like, of some new stuff, which which I'm thrilled to be bringing. I know that a lot of people are very looking forward to it as well. Um, I think it, I'm not sure which one of you said this some years ago that uh, that music is supposed to do something like act on the listener or on the audience in some way. Mm -hmm. um, what were you thinking of when uh, one of you said that? <laughs> mm. Well, I th you know, I think all music, apart from you know pop music that struggles to be as mundane as possible does have an effect you know and it's um you know sometimes it's it's uh, the, the simplest effect of of tapping your feet or you know making you uh work harder in the factory or drive f faster to work or buy more products in the supermarket and sometimes it can be a, a kind of effect that you know when you're listening late at night you put on a track and suddenly whole worlds you know open up in your head and you begin to feel transported mm. and to me those those kind of effects are always the most fun to try to generate and the most fun for us to experience uh, when my my whole motivation for for making music with coil was to find or to to acquire the music that I couldn't buy anywhere else, the music that I wanted to listen to late at night. And some people, you know, some people just in the past few years are beginning to, or maybe I'm just beginning to find that those CDs that begin to do that for me a little bit, but by and large it still continues after 20 years as I'm still making the kind of music that you know, I'd want to be tuning the dial kind of almost at random, you know, at mm. one o'clock in the morning after I've had a hard day at work and I've, you know, had 20 minutes in the tub and I get into bed and I put the radio on and I'm tuning the dial and I suddenly come across something that takes me elsewhere. Mm. And those moments, you know, that's those moments are the ones that we that we all do it for, f from, from my point of view anyway. Mm. And there's a lot of... Um, underside of the soul being explored in a lot of uh, coil material, and this some of this goes back to uh, a lot of ideas that lived in in Throbbing Gristle and Psychic TV. And when you and John 
uh, broke off from psychic TV, which already had its, had its own sort of interest in ritual and magic. Mm -hmm. What did you want to do differently than what was going on there? Well, with psychic TV, um, we were very interested in the way that people were beginning to use uh, sort of religion and, and spiritual ideas to, I guess, make changes in their lives in a, a sort of tangibly different way from from uh, evangelistic uh, Christian or Muslim preachers that were at that time, you know, becoming much more prevalent and much more noticeable and kind of louder. Hmm. And we were interested in the fact that if you know, if you were conscious of the kind of things that those cults were doing, uh, and you were brave enough to try and use them for yourself in a kind of in the opposite way, in other words, as a kind of deprogramming and a kind of liberation, um, that you could you could learn things about yourself and about the world that were positive and useful and were not fundamentally uh, aligned in in the direction of the control of of the of the uh, masses or the congregation okay. uh, at, and the bending of their will to the to the whims of the guy who was in the pulpit and um you know we felt that that was a definitely a bad thing and that people should you know uh, be thinking more carefully for themselves about spiritual matters and taking the responsibility for their own development now that was fine and good as far as it went but somehow along the way there um uh we kind of fell out with genesis uh, Peorage, who at that time was we were working with, who, who, and he, I think, had aspirations to being a, a leader of some kind. Uh, and and John and I felt that leaders were not what we needed. We needed more congregation. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was kind of why we fell out. But to answer your question more directly, when Coil started, it was basically John's idea, and he, you know, he felt that there were there were lots of musical things that he wanted to explore and I was happy to sort of help and provide the kind of technical and musical side of things and it was only after a year or so that you know we started to think well what what are the the issues you know that we think are important for people and that uh, you know that can be used as ideas on a record that actually you know, challenge people, but also help people, and you know, get people to think about things in a different way. What were some of those ideas? That well, you for us at the time, we were, um, you know, as gay men. In uh, I guess I was 24 or 25 when Carl started, and John was probably 18. One of the issues that was was uppermost in our minds was the 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 new. Um, plague that was spreading everywhere that, that first was called grid and subsequently became you know AIDS and HIV and suddenly <coughs> excuse me our friends started dying and so or getting ill anyway and dying in due course and and you know the two first of the the first of our two albums are a lot to do with you know our experience of, of finding our friends die and us thinking about how it must be to be in that position and you know I mean uh, and issues I guess, of the mortality of the issues of mortality and yeah exactly and and immortality yeah yeah, yeah. then I you know I, I think that that's a common you know theme for young people to think about but you know it's it's an important one when were you first exposed to um, ideas of the uh, occult and Aleister Crowley in particular I wasn't um, particularly aware in school of the the intellectual side of it, but I think that I've always, you know, had a a, 
an empathy or a f- you know a feeling that there were forces and eddies and ripples and things that influenced the the normal run of events that were not recognized you know by you know western society and and those those things were not gen- you know were not um satisfactorily explained by you know the the literature about ghosts or about poltergeists or about astrology or about any of those um you know relatively simplistic pseudosciences that that uh you know that attempt to go some way to explaining why some some days are good and some days are not mm. and so when i met actually it wasn't really till i met john that i learned um what little i do know about the, the kind of uh, history and uh, uh, the sort of intellectual side of it and largely that interest was came about through our interest in the work of austin osman spare who was an uh, an occult artist who lived in london from the late 18th century sorry late 19th century to till i think he died in 1956 and he was a kind of follower of crowley and for a while there and um he was a kind of a shamanistic artist and his his pictures are great and you know and, and we started collecting those at the same time as what do they look like um the early ones look a little bit like um Aubrey Beardsley and uh, with a kind of uh, William Blake kind of overtones in as he, when he was studying um, he went to art college and his early stuff looks like that and then he became a an official war artist in during the first world war and and so to painted uh, and drew and painted large canvases of the of the horror of the Ypres and all that and after that his obviously uh, you know having had that experience his work kind of splintered off into several um kind of more uh deranged kind of offshoots for a long time he painted uh, well rather drew um hollywood um movie stars but in in a sort of very what he called sidereal which was um the the drawings were sort of distorted mm. uh, along different planes and so it was almost like he was taking a flat photograph of Spencer Tracy or whatever and and turning it at an on angle and redrawing it so as though he was trying to perceive something beneath the surface of the of the image and from there his his work became almost psychedelic in in the traditional sense of being very bright colors and very um very vivid and with m- many different elements of animals and um you know strange uh african faces and uh automatic writing okay um and that was before you know lsd was ever synthesized so so he was a he was the kind of um the one who opened the door to my interest in in the sort of classical uh, occult uh, tradition, if you like, and, and and in fact, I'm to this day I wouldn't regard myself as any kind of an expert in that, but um, you know I do think that the the whatever it is, the nine tenths of the brain that we currently don't have an explanation for. You know, is is continues to work. You know, still it's doing stuff. It's just we haven't learnt how to quite to train it to do what we want. And some, you know, in a hundred years' time, maybe people have figured that out. Putting all these ideas into a sonic sort of context and or song context it poses, you know, several challenges. What are some of those challenges? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it's never been our intention to. To kind of prophesize or to to kind of preach or to try and say to people, you know, wake up! You need to be thinking about this occult thing, or you need to be, uh, you know, protesting against the use of, you know, dolphins in war or whatever. You know, we've never been great uh, agit prop uh, uh, 
uh, exponents, but at the same time, you know, the music that we make comes from, as you were saying before, a kind of the, you know, the, the part of the soul that's not normally on public display. And so it's inevitable that the things, the subjects that interest us, are, you know, are going to, to bubble to the surface and to, and to be sources of, you know, John, you know, for John, the sources of words, and for me, they tend to be more sort of sources of atmosphere or mood that, you know, goes through phases of being angry, you know, calmer introspective, depressed, happy, sad, you know. Um, so I tend not so much to contribute to the words, but more to, to the actual flow of the, of the sound, if you like. Okay. So it's not that we actually try, I mean, I think it would be more or less impossible to try and take those things that we were just talking about and, and sort of reduce them to a couplet. Mm. Um, well, I certainly don't have No, but there's, you know, things like psychoacoustics, right? And even the, the music in the dark project, I mean, if sensory deprivation, you know, causes all kinds of sorts of audio things to happen that might mm -hmm. be in line with a lot of these ideas as well, right? Yeah, that's true. I, I think with, you know, the, the direct connection between um, frequency and, and physical response was something that we... Uh, investigated in Throbbing Crystal quite a bit and had large speakers and, and um, audio systems that went beyond the normal range of, of, of you know, a regular PA or hi-fi. And uh, in, in doing so, um, the members of Throbbing Crystal, myself and Chris and Cozy and Genesis, were, you know, quite often physically sick or had, you know, um, optical, you know, tunneling effects and uh you know things that could be regarded as probably not very good for one's health yeah. and and so uh when f when throbbing gristle um was terminated in in the early 80s we i sort of felt that i'd done that and i was more interested in the more subtle uh things that you could do with sound and the way that for example harmony or the lack of it can can lead you along a path, and certainly in the music that we've been doing most recently, uh, I'm interested more in you know making music that leads people along a path to a new new place that they may not have seen before, uh, but not you know not as a method to hit them on the head with any particular effect or particular, you know, alarming physical sensation. Well, several years ago, we were talking about deep listening as a mm -hmm. kind of aesthetic, I guess, uh, philosophy of, right. of what you were up to, and what did you mean by that exactly? But, well, you know, the the um, when you go to a, a stage hypnosis meeting, or if you see a you know a kind of TV hypnotist who's who's um, basically whose job it is to to uh, get people to behave in an you know in an amusing way uh, without doing too much you know and anything too distressing but at the same time to amuse the audience by by convincing people that they're chickens or whatever the way that he's doing that is by first of all winning their confidence and secondly by um encouraging them to allow him to communicate more or less directly with their subconscious or, or or more more deep parts of their consciousness anyway that um bypass one's normal you know reticence and reluctance and shyness and 
what we what I particularly was interested in doing was to try to see if it was possible with music to address or to begin to uh, bypass the the parts of your brain that would listen to a record to say oh I don't like this because it's not like dot 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 whatever um, and whether it was possible to communicate or to have one's uh, frequency and gradually shifting pitch uh, get through or break through to a deeper part of the listening mind and in doing that it might be that you could change people's perceptions about what they were listening to and hopefully uh, encourage them to experience the record in a different way. I think somewhere along the way you said that you thought that music was a crude medium, that film and television can affect our realities a little more effectively and profoundly. Hmm, that I must have been dumb <laughs> if I said that. Uh, I think music's actually much more mm, subtle in a way, although you know, in 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 the best of all possible worlds, you can have you know music connected with pictures. But the way that we listen to to music is 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 fundamentally different to to the, the you know watching a movie, and the circumstances are different too. Generally, you know, usually when you watch a movie, either in the theatre or at home, you're watching it with friends, and so your perception of it to some extent depends on how you want to appear to your friends and to you know your peers and how you want them to see you reacting you know so yeah. it would be interesting for me and if i was you know for a long time i was involved in the, t in the, t the music business from the point of view of making music videos and and uh, for a while there uh, for a long while i was i aspired to directing feature films but in the past five or so years i've come to the conclusion that what I would like to do is make, you know, moving image that could be connected with sound or, you know, played at the same time. That was, you know, only for people to watch on their own so that they could, you know, perceive it more in the way that you, you listen to radio late at night. <sighs> this. I'm sure I'd be interested to know if you, if you know the answer to this question, but I would imagine that 99% of your listeners are listening on their own. Yes, I think they are. It's, yeah. I think that the hour definitely determines that. It's not uh, after midnight, not normally a social time. Right. Yeah. And it would be great for me to be able to make movies or to make you know, um, moving pictures for people on their own because I think that they would see them in a very different light. Well, this is now becoming more possible with a lot of this DVD stuff that is starting to become more widely distributed. You, you know, the link up is is definitely the potential seems more tangible than it's been in a while. Mm. I mean, how especially with with um, you know with streaming yeah. uh, images and stuff like that. I mean, I'm sure in a few years' time, when when the bandwidth you know becomes sufficient, you know, most people on their computers are on their computers alone, and. You know, so when when it becomes possible to watch image and receive sound on your computer, you know, to a to a certain standard of of quality, then I think that'll open up some interesting possibilities. Mm. Well, how has Coil been uh, affected by uh, technology and its its evolution in the audiovisual uh, fields? Has it affected your ideas too? It's uh, the t you know, evolving technology has made a lot of things possible that that simply were impossible uh, at the beginning. Um, when Coil started, uh, well, even before Coil started, actually, I was using a um, an Apple II um, computer to to sample sound and to play back sound, you know, chunks of sound. Before, I think, even before the Fairlight was was um, available, wow. and the f you know, we used one of the first Fairlights in the UK on on our first album. And you know we've continued to to try and you know keep up with the highest of tech in order to use it in the opposite way than what it was designed for. I don't think many people know what the Fairlight 
is, though. Fairlight. The Fairlight was um, a, a keyboard that was actually the first commercially available keyboard that would play back samples. You know, so in other words, you could you could have, if you wanted, you could have a, you know, a set of trumpet notes recorded across the keyboard. So as you hit a key, a trumpet would come out. And this is, you know, this is everyday commonplace technology now. But in in 1981 or 1980 or whenever there were very few you know this was cutting edge technology and um some some bands you know like i don't know yes or somebody like that could mm. probably afford them these these things cost and they were huge too they were they? huge yeah. and there was actually a kind of a buzz around lloyds of london when when we hired one this this first fairlight that was in the country because everyone was reluctant to ensure you know these madcap teenagers you know from renting this thing that that cost more than our house it cost <laughs> twice as much as our house actually and uh, even to rent you know it, was, it cost a substantial sum of money for the two weeks that we that we hired it um but it was it was uh, quite special in those days mm-hmm. um and more recently the advancing technology you know is it's only because of advancing technology that that we started to play live because um up until 1980 um, although you could have, obviously, you could have samplers, and you know everybody has a, a, a keyboard sampler nowadays. The, the the technology didn't really exist to make to have the control that we wanted to have over the structure of of a live performance. You know, uh, in the past few years, a, a company out of Berlin called Ableton, who make a program called Live, which allows you to uh, have um, predefined units of sound, but to spontaneously uh, control the way that they come out and the, the sequence and the order and you know the style and the way they sound and so it's it's um, for the first time for uh, someone who's a basically not a trained musician um, you can actually control the flow of of um, frequency and sounds and uh, beats or you know pulses or whatever uh, at you know at that moment at the moment of creation but at the same time you know it's still working with th- you know pre- predefined units that you've t- devised in the studio or, or you know that you've recorded yourself so we never wanted to ever be a kind of band that basically shows up on stage and plays the CD and just sings along or, you know, mimes to the music because that didn't seem... we didn't see the point of that. It was not a live performance, although, you know, many, many, many artists do that today. Mm. Can you uh, describe your sort of ideal live setting, which, from what I've been reading, also involves some pretty elaborate performative elements as well? (laughs) <laughs> well, I don't think there's any such thing as a perfect live setting. Is that the, you know, a live performance is is really just a moment of communication between two people. You know, the, the guy on stage and the, the person in the audience. And you know, I've been saying now for a few years that would it be great to be able to busk, you know, like a busker in a on the sidewalk or in a subway station with electronic music. Mm-hmm. You know, because it, it would be the opposite of what people would expect, and and you know, it's, it, it, the very idea of taking synthesizers and and um, especially modular and antique kinds of synthesizers, which are what we often use, you know, into a subway station would be ridiculous and impossible and bizarre. But it would be fantastic to be able to to go with a power book, you know, down onto the subway and actually make the kind of music that we make, which is you know, sort of using all kinds of different sounds and and. Uh, trying to get people to think about sound in a different way in that setting. Um, so I don't think that you know there's any such thing as that perfect live experience. What we always try and do is to is to kind of confound people's expectations and help people to you know sort of to, as I was saying before to lead people along a path and and come with us to sort of see you know, see a different place than is the place that's inside us. Well, are there, are there any that rank, performances that rank among effective, or that you think are were effective that way? Well, each of the little sub-tours that, we, that we've done in the past two and a half years, the, the, 
um, there's there's basically sort of four phases, if you like, that we went through. That the first one was very kind of electronic and dark, and we first played that in a church in Barcelona for the part of the Sonar Festival, um, and there was kind of a riot for because the the they hadn't estimated the amount of people that wanted to come in, and so this. The, this church, this very beautiful kind of 15th century stone church right in the, the little piazza or whatever Spanish, the Spanish for piazza is, was kind of um, transformed into this kind of s sweaty, kind of heaving, dark kind of mass, which was great. And I mean, people had a fantastic time. And there were all these kind of um, <clears throat> topless men and women of you know, various sort of Spanish types who are kind of going bonkers. And it was really, really good. And... Um, and then the second phase that we did, we uh, we performed actually in um, in Moscow in September. I think about a week after 9/11, uh, mm -hmm. we actually saw the 9/11 take from from a, a hotel room in St. Petersburg, which is weird. Um, so that 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 aspect of of the show was was more <clears throat> this kind of a sort of stepping stone. It had songs in it. But they were, they were quite, you know, they were quite electronic and and um, challenging, if you like. <laughs> <laughs> and the the next phase was uh, what we did last um, spring, which we took around Western Europe. And the the best show of that was definitely in Bologna, in Italy. And the, the um, I'm, this is a cheap plug. The, we are actually releasing a DVD of that show because we had some great uh, um, camera shots and. And um, P.S. and Massimo of Black Sun Productions were with us and were, uh, you know, adding a kind of um, Romanesque sort of uh, performance, uh, f you know, foreground to the yeah, background who, of the who music. Who are Black Sun Productions, exactly? They're two rent boys, I'm sure they wouldn't mind me describing <laughs> them as that, from, uh, from Zurich in, well, one's from Zurich in Switzerland and one's from Italy. And they're a couple and they just they just finished building actually a, a bar for the artist Geiger, mm -hmm. you know, who who designed um, Alien and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, he's, he recently opened a bar in, in Switzerland and, and they they built that for him. So they're kind of fairly, then they're fairly um, t tough and physical characters who are capable of building bars as well as doing all the things that they do. I'm just trying to be discreet for you. Well, no, please audience. don't be discreet at all. Well, having, like having, come from, <laughs> <laughs> having come from a a fairly uh, open sexual uh, background. I mean, I think they met on a street corner somewhere, probably. I think you know when they were in competition mm -hmm. for the Zurich bankers. Um, they, uh, they opened a, an S and M club and ran that for some time until the Zurich police decided that they, they were sort of pushing the bounds of Swiss sensibility too far. Now, is this the raid that just happened in March on their offices? That was a. I think they'd been raided a number of times before that, but the, the, uh, that was so stupid. I mean, the, the some some part of Swiss law makes it illegal to show on videotape or you know on on any kind of any kind of video um, a man taking a pee, mm. and you know one would think that was a relatively harmless thing that you know you see on at any rate late night you know kind of blooper video shows and home video you know and you know it's, it's not really the most shocking thing in the world for goodness sake and uh, that that was the reason that they, they somebody m mailed them some videos like that and that was the reason for the latest raid mm. so uh, what did they do for coil then on the stage well they were being relatively um static and you know self self-contained and and uh interesting looking i mean they're both you know in are both very you know handsome young men and and um they're just something nice to look at <laughs> and we're, when i mean we're not particularly in the business of making sex shows as such but you know you can in the context of of you know what is conventionally thought of as being a sort of you know rock sort of show just the fact of having two utterly uh, unashamed and thoroughly well endowed young men standing on the front of your stage in front of your performance it, you know it does change the perception of of your audience and makes them you know question whether they're feeling comfortable or uncomfortable aroused shocked mm. 
whatever you know and it, and it's interesting to to push people's preconceptions as much as possible so they're part of the third phase of they were part of the third and the fourth phase the fourth okay. phase which which um, took place last uh, autumn uh, was around um, Eastern Europe we started in Scandinavia and went down through Poland through Gdansk we played in Gdansk and in Łódź and Ch po uh, Czechoslovakia and Hungary and down through all that th those parts of the world and although the the music that we was were doing was fine and and was kind of development of the of the the spring show and the the black sun guys were they had costumes that rather difficult to describe they were the um they had sort of pointed hats that in some way were a little bit like Ku Klux Klan but but they were black and more they had TV aerials coming out of the top what that were actually Austin Osman spare sigils and so they came on looking like kind of very pointed sort of chimneys or something and then at some point at a certain point in the show parts of their costume you know were removed to, to to reveal them as naked and Massimo um, read a very touching uh, poem um, in Italian by Pasolini in at the beginning of a song that we did about Pasolini uh, called Ostia mm. uh, and so that was you know intense in a different kind of way but the experience that we had of, tra of traveling down through through um, Eastern Europe was was in a way quite depressing because, you know, although on the surface the you know the the trappings of of communism have have gone, you know, people n now are in a position to, you know, vote for the people they want and to you know to have, you know, commercial freedom and to do all that stuff. In the reality of those countries is that, you know, they're still incredibly poor and you cannot. You know, the people that came to our shows had to scrimp and save to pay five bucks for the admission and couldn't afford to buy a T-shirt, you know. And, and in fact, we ended up giving quite a lot of merchandising and stuff away because, right. you know, people obviously were just not in in any position to be able to afford that stuff. And that's quite, you know, coming from the West, it's, it's still shocking to see people that, you know, you think were part of the EEC and all that, you know, it's not being able to afford, you know, a T-shirt or a CD or anything. Mm. So it was, it was kind of a, you know, it was, it was a bit of a shock for us in a way. I want to um, ask you about the, uh, well, what do drugs do for the making of your music in the <laughs> process of it and in the listening of it? I would be lying if I said that I wasn't interested in taking lots of different types of drugs in order to achieve, to ha in order to have different types of experience. But having said that, I think that there's no point in repeating a drug experience just because you're bored. You know, I, you know. I think that you can have one psychedelic experience of whatever kind it is, as long as it's you know in a safe setting and in a in a a positive setting, and that's all you ever need to know to go to that place again. Um, we have done records that that refer directly to different kinds of of molecules, and many of which you know are not illegal and also not available. Mm -hmm. You know, because we have you know, friends and, and uh, know people that, you know, in the past have made those uh, substances available. You know, I think the repeated use of, of chemicals simply to avoid some part of reality that you don't like is, is really a waste of time, and it's just as it is to repeatedly get drunk. Okay, so it's not an escapist sort of issue for you at all? It's a, not a very all, pointed, think, focusing kind of thing, right? You know, I think if... if if you can, you know, the more people see how, you know, beautiful the world is and how you can look at uh, 
an ice cube or a tulip, you know, and be moved to tears. I mean, that sounds dumb, you know, but it's, I believe that it's true. You know, you can look at something that we ignore, and if you look at it carefully enough, it, it can become the most beautiful thing in the world. And if, you know, if people responsibly and in a safe situation help themselves to those insights or those visions, then to me there's no reason why that should be bad for them or bad for society. Mm. What's bad for society and bad for those people is to use it to escape. Well, what and it just seems like it's a shame to me that, you know, we, we're not in a position to be able to, you know, make part of that enlarged vision of the world part of our educational system. You know, it seems to me that, you know, uh, uh, by the time we get to 12th grade or whenever it is that you're, you know, close to being an adult and uh, intelligent, there should be, you know, like a, a drugs 101 or something, you know, where people in a safe situation can learn more about themselves and about the world. Mm. And, you know, people should not have to go down to bad parts of town and buy bad things from bad people. It's and junior chemists. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, we, we just... Society has some things... Ask about face, as they say. Can you say if there are, you know, or is a, a certain drug that uh, you found to be incredibly insightful musically for you? I don't. I don't think I. I could name one in particular, just because. Uh, I think I. I personally am first and foremost a, a visual type of person. I think that my main, my my most, you know, my deepest um, artistic drive is in the creation of pictures whether they're pictures on a piece of paper or on a tv screen or in your head and so you know i have in the past had psychedelic experiences but my memory of them is first and foremost of the way that my vision of the world changed and not so much in terms of hearing you know the symphonies of lights or smells or whatever you know you might have you know th that are musical in 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 form mm. actually to me the the best place the the best state to be in to make music is early in the morning you know when you've woken up and you've been for a walk in the fresh air and you've had a ju some juice you know and you're feeling <clears throat> fresh and completely in the now and the present and not under the influence of anything generally you know if you if you even alcohol you know anything that you take tends to dull your, your hearing first of yeah. all and also the creative process so yeah, it, you know those those times when you know we have recorded music under the influence of alcohol or whatever else um nine times out of ten there are things that i would have, about them that i would have done differently you know had i been completely myself Because of a lot of the uh, the sort of fearless ideas that that Coyle have have explored over the years and continue to, it's it's. I would imagine that you've attracted your fair share of negative attention from um, what should we call them, the authorities, uh, censors, the morality police, that sort of thing. Um, are there any examples of this? Um, well, friends of mine have had it a lot worse than we have. Genesis, for example, was. Uh put in a very difficult position in the early 90s because uh, a TV program on English TV uh, claimed or people in the, that show claimed that he was 
doing all kinds of stuff that he wasn't in fact doing uh, and a few smaller things and lesser and lesser important things that he actually was doing um, and as a consequence of that he decided not to return to the UK and, and sort of emigrated to the US for a number of years mm -hmm. and was uh, vilified in the pr English press and uh, had all kinds of you know personal and, and uh, you know difficulties with his house and his possessions and being confiscated and stuff like that so um, John and I have been relatively lucky in terms of um, it not happening to us directly but you know it it does happen you know some friends of ours who uh, well for example uh, Mr. Sebastian who was a, a tattooist who who uh, tattooed all of us I think and introduced us to body piercing before anyone knew what it was got into trouble in the mid 90s and there was a, a famous uh, case called Operation Spanner which um, basically uh, got him and some friends of his into a lot of trouble they were, they were in prison for a long time as a consequence of something that they were doing that was entirely consensual and you know, didn't involve. There was it was completely victimless, but because the social mores and the public um, position that the the tabloid press took at that time, you know, it was regarded as something that they should not be doing to themselves. Mm. Um, and the outcome of that was that several of his friends committed suicide in prison, and oh he subsequently died. You know, you could say of a broken heart or whatever, but. Um, you know, he was certainly, his life was ruined by these people that did that. Um, so, you know, on the one hand, you know, I'm sort of angry about, you know, the, those parts of society that do not seem to be making kind of fair and reasonable judgments about all kinds of things, you know, from sexual behavior to well, drugs as we said but also you know to the you know foreign policy of the USA to all kinds of environmental issues you know the, the, I'm, it's it's easy not to be optimistic about the state of humanity when seen as a package mm. and the only way to be optimistic and the only way that you know, I hope that that Coyle's music is optimistic. It's because it's a it's communication between me and you, you know, and it's a communication between the performer and the man or woman or boy or girl who's sitting at home listening to the radio late at night. And it's those things, it's that communication that's important. There's been a some fairly long uh, gaps between studio recordings by Coyle, and uh, the ones that have come out have been very limited edition and sort of limited circulation as well. Um, so you've been sort of avoiding the regular conventions of releasing material on labels with certain, you know, regular normal distribution and licensing deals. What's uh, What's been behind that? I think business ineptitude, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, we've quite quite a number of times we've come close to being um, signed by majors, and um, the the most well known of those was uh, um, for a long while there we had a, a great relationship with Trent Reznor of Nine Inch Nails. Yeah, it was and there supposed he was, to be a record? He, he was kind enough to give us lo loads of studio time and and assist us financially, and and um, we were bullish enough not to ever deliver the record that we agreed to deliver to him and and we still hope to do that but it's like we were saying before you know we don't because the music that we make has has to come from the heart as as soon as you you know take money for it it somehow it feels to us like it's you know corrupted in some way or and, and that sounds dumb you know because why can't we get it together to be commercial you know but but um we still you know we still uh, aspire to, to finishing that record even though it's taken it will have taken 10 years mm. and the, the you know the tapes the tapes have <laughs> got some great material on them you know that occasionally little bits of it leak out mm. 
there's a track called Cold Cell, which is on the, the Russian record that um, we sent over there. That, that um, The double, the golden hair. Right. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's kind of a compilation of, of, of things from all kind of different periods. Uh, but that track was recorded in New Orleans in, in Trent Studio. So uh, mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's all kinds of things that, that are still awaiting release there. And, and hopefully, you know, if Trent's still talking to us after all, this, all these years, <laughs> then hopefully he will release it at some point. Mm -hmm. But But it's not so much that we try and limit... Um, our accessibility and in, f in fact quite the reverse so you know we would like our records to be available to everyone and and now with the internet it's possible to at any rate by mail order you know to get hold of our records worldwide but the problem with with uh, you know major labels is that they don't really kn know what it is that we do or why it is that we do it and it's often not sustainable and sort of yeah exactly yeah. you know and it's not like we We've been touring until very recently at all, and you know we don't really have a profile, and and it's just you know we're weird. <laughs> well, I mean, you certainly have an audience that 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 sticks with you. Uh, thank heavens, gosh, thank heavens for that. Yeah, I'm, I mean, we, it does seem like we do. Although, also having said that, you know, the audiences that we were getting um, in in Europe contained. They certainly had a, a, a hardcore of you know people in their thirties and even dare I say it in their forties, but also there was a bunch of kids there too that seemed to enjoy it just as much, mm. you know, and, and had all the makings uh, it seems of of being new new full time fans kind of thing. So so hopefully you know it's not age restricted in any way. It's much more about um, the the philosophy or the the point of view that those people have in common. Even though some of them, you know, like are wearing black trench coats, and some of them are wearing, you know, corduroy jackets and smoking pipes and stuff like that, it's 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 a coil audience is something to to behold. I can tell you. Yeah. Well, there are elements of it. I mean, I could imagine there might be some obsessive elements to a coil fan. Does this ever become troublesome? Sometimes, but uh, I don't want to talk about that. Really. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> Your, uh, the band's first North American appearance was uh, uh, August 2001. Why did it take so long? Well, I, actually, that was quite soon after we started playing. It okay, was, so it was, was only like a few months after we after our first ever show. So that, in, in fact, it wasn't really long from from in that aspect. It was long because, as like we said, you know, the technology had only just got to the stage where I could go on stage, you know, and know that I could play for an hour and. You know that all I had at my fingertips. You know all of the sounds and moods and things that I wanted to to be able to use as raw material, but at the same time, to to be able to make a, a new performance and a spontaneous and uh, a performance that was tailored directly for that moment and f for me to feel that I was able to communicate those th those ideas and movements and shapes and sounds there and then. You know rather than just playing a backing track. Mm. Well, what will be the uh, the setup that you're going to bring to Montreal then for uh, your Mutech appearance? Te technically, do you mean? Or? Uh, yeah, and Thai Paul Sandra as well is going to be with you, right? Yeah, Thai Paul Sandra is, is um, my keyboard wizard. Uh, he's, he's going to be uh, playing at least two, if not three, um, modular-type synthesizers, uh, as well as um, you know conventional keyboards and piano and stuff. And... I will most probably just be playing my Macintosh Titanium PowerBook, <laughs> um, uh, but at the same time we also we have um, a fairly extensive video projection um, system that projects onto us and uh, as well as behind us and and the videos, are, although they're pre-designed, are actually made to fit different tracks and you know, there's, it's not like wallpaper kind of video. It's like intentional. And in what selections, like what music? Uh, well, uh, quite a lot of material actually we'll be playing is new. There'll be one or two. Okay. To, in fact, I'm I'm hoping I haven't actually talked to Tapal Sandra about this, but I'm hoping to to play a track of our first ever album, uh, uh, Scatology, which is sorry, I'm lying. It was on Horse Rotavator. It's called the First Five Minutes After Death. There's a track on on the uh, the Russian double there that um, is called the First Five Minutes After Violent Death, which is a slightly different version. Um, but it's fundamentally the same piece of music, okay. and it it describes, or it attempts to illustrate what we felt was the experience 
uh, you know, of somebody post their demise. And it's obviously, of course, five minutes after violent death <laughs> yeah. is a is a slightly different experience. But uh, um, but uh, nevertheless, um, it's it's I it's one of those pieces of music that I still can play. You know, with the same sensations of um, awe and excitement and horror <laughs> as it was when I made that piece of music 25 years ago or whatever. It seems like it's stood the test of time. One last question, actually. Do you call okay. Thy Paul Sandra Thy for short? Thypes. I call him Thypes. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but please don't ask me where he got the name from. I, I, I th he, he was, for a long time, um, in the thrall of uh, an, uh, a rather eccentric English artist by the name of Julian Cope. Yes. And I believe that Julian... Um, named him? Named him Thypes Sandra. But I could, be, I could be entirely wrong about that. All right. But, uh, he, yeah, he, you know, I don't know if his mum calls him that, to be honest. His mum is a very small wiry Welsh uh, sort of goat figure who, <laughs> who is constantly asking whether it's time for tea and whether she can have another glass of wine. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> well, again, Peter, thanks, thanks a lot. And, uh, You're very we'll, welcome. We'll I see can't, you. I can't wait to come. I'm really looking forward to it. All right, we are too. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks.